Hello and welcome to our small but significant area of the UK. The Lizard Peninsula in Cornwall is an area of outstanding natural beauty on the southerly tip of the country. Today we're showcasing the importance of farming for biodiversity while sustaining productive and profitable livelihoods for the farmers working in this unique location. Joining us, we have David Oates from Rizuic Organic Farm. He's a seventh generation award-winning organic farmer managing 1,200 acres of grassland, cropping, woodland and heathland. The environment is at the heart of every decision made on his farm. Sarah and James Richards run two farms, Tregominion and Bruggan, which includes a pedigree herd of ruby red Devon cattle, a flock of pedigree sheep and pick your own Christmas trees. Since joining the business, Sarah has also started selling beef and hoggart boxes, allowing the farm to sell its high quality, sustainably produced meat directly to the public. And Rona Amiss is a first generation award winning tenant farmer running Tregullis Farm, which includes a farm shop and cafe, giving her the opportunity to directly interact with the public every day to educate and inform about the importance of environmentally sustainable farming. Her approach sits perfectly with the ethos of her landlords, the National Trust. So thank you all very much for joining me. Let's get straight to it. Clearly, uh, you all have the environment at the heart of your thinking and your farming techniques. But very quickly, I'd like to ask each of you why farming this way is so important to you. Uh, Sarah and James, let's uh, start with you. Well, we've, um, as a family, we've been farming here on the Lizard for as far back as we can we can trace so at least sort of 500 years so we we feel very much part of the landscape ourselves so it's kind of incumbent on us to then try and look after it and cherish it and and uh, improve it um, for future generations i mean we've we've recently had a child ourselves so it gives you a new kind of outlook on life and you you, you do try to then think and plan ahead for the next generation and try and at least give them as good an environment that you grew up in and I, I grew up on a on an organic dairy farm actually, and um, my my mum particularly was very keen on making sure that everything was very natural, that we worked with the environment instead of against it. And so coming to the farm and joining James, it's kind of something that I I've, I've come from that background and want to continue it, working with James to make our farm that way as well. Great, and, and how about you? Um, I think as a first generation farming, I um, joined. Um, the agriculture industry when I left school I always wanted to farm I grew up in the country and I think I was completely shocked about modern agriculture it's quite a long time ago now and it was just that the organic movement was starting to get going and I found it was a natural fit what I wanted from farming and so I've always been involved with the environmental style of farming um, sometimes it's not just all about producing the most it's how you produce it all and uh, over the years we've farmed how we felt most comfortable with and the lizard is such a great place to do environmental type farming because there's such a lot of things going on. Great and David uh, how is environmentally important uh, respective uh, farming important to you? Uh, well I'm very similar to James and Sarah really been here a long time on our farm and I still farm with my dad um, and he's done things very similar to what I want to do um, and I think what we like to do, what we like to emphasize is the educational part of it. There's so much misinformation about the biodiversity and food being produced terribly, especially meat. Um, and I just want to show people that what, how it can be done, that eating meat isn't necessarily bad for the environment. And we try to um, have a whole rounded package to show people really. Great. And so in terms of, um your practices that you all use to uh, to help with biodiversity on your farms. I mean, they can be wide ranging, of course, but uh, Rona, what are some of the most successful things that you've implemented um, that you've been able to show the impact on biodiversity? I think the most successful thing we've done to the farm, we've been here seven years now, and the most successful thing is bringing livestock um, and, and livestock that fit the farm. So we use a rotational system and we have um, some ground we plow up and put cereals in. Uh, we have um, grass, herbal grass lays, and we have permanent pasture and the livestock are rotated around them. And that seems to give the greatest biodiversity having uh, a mixed farming system. It's not the easiest farming system to try and make any money at. Um, and you have to 
pretty much think outside the box to make it work. Um, we've got very small fields, but we've got loads and loads of tourists. So we balance it by being able to sell our produce direct. Um, and that gives us a little bit extra margin, which means that we don't have to be full pelt trying to be intensive. We can really be a bit more extensive. We can be a bit more relaxed about when the um, livestock are slaughtered, what age they're slaughtered at, because we can get a little bit more margin for doing that. We also sell our story. So if people know what they're getting, they'll pay a little bit more for it. Um, and um, people are really interested in biodiversity and, and the doors open to talk to people uh, and they will pay a little bit more, not a lot more, but a little bit more. And uh, staying on that same point then, uh, Sarah and James, you have recently started doing your, your meat boxes, um, selling directly to the public. Have you found that that's really helped with the um, people's knowledge of the farm? Do you think your story is, is important and has it made you even more aware of the biodiversity around your system? I think it is very important, like, like Ren says about selling a story, making sure that people are aware that, that the product we're selling is a quality product. Um, although I would slightly disagree, well not disagree, one of the issues I think that, that we come up against time and time again with beef boxes is that it is actually branded a luxury product and something that I feel quite strongly is that it shouldn't be a luxury product to sell meat that is decent. It should be that is the, the standard product and actually what we're buying from supermarkets potentially, I know we call them the bad guys, but even, even sometimes butchers, it's, it's processed meat. It's not the meat that we should be eating and we ate in the past. And I think it's quite an important thing to remember that, that, that although we're having to make the price higher, it's partly because we're not able to sell it enough. There's not enough of a market at the moment to be able to sell it at a cheaper price. So um, I think that's something that, that maybe we need to start thinking about educating everybody in this country to think that actually that, that this isn't the gold standard, brilliant, high quality meat. This is actually what meat is. OK, and so looking at David there, I know that you and your, farm, that your family have pre previously gone to um, direct sales as well. You are back in the way of selling into the mainstream system now. How do we go about educating the public? about the so that they know where your uh, your cattle and your sheep have been grazing and what how do we get them to know and and look for and search for the products that you produce um yeah it's a tricky one we we stopped selling directly basically because there wasn't enough of a margin um to warrant standing in a farm shop we felt you know if you paid yourself an hourly wage the margin you're gaining from the from the premium of the meat is then going on your wages and there's not actually much difference at the end of the day but i think um from my point of view we're trying to do a lot more educating of schools so getting children from a young age and also various online events like this and being part of more social media as well online presence i think is trying to reach a wider audience and um one thing which we do on the farm as well is we're a wedding venue and that gets thousands of people onto our farm every year but what's unique about that is the people that come would not normally be on a farm they're there for a wedding they're not there for the countryside and um, by getting them out here they always leave and look around feeling like they've learned a little bit and just been in an environment that people wouldn't normally be in. I see and staying with that environment um around the Lizard Peninsula here, we are an AONB, an area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, one of the big parts of, we've obviously got huge coastal areas, but one of the big uh, land air masses that we have here are the heathlands. So um, David, I know you actually farm a lot of the heathland areas um, and they are hugely important for very rare plants and animals. Um, I know that you graze cattle on those lands, so um, it does, does look quite damaging. Can you explain to us, and because um, I know you obviously would be explaining to those people who do visit your farm, what, how that's not damaging to that environment, or, or is it? Um, so, no, that's a common misconception, especially grazing is one part. Another big part is actually burning, which is controversial to lots of people who don't understand the science behind it, but basically 
we we rent, own, have rights to various different bits of uh, heathland across the lizard, and each piece of heathland is slightly different. Um, and it's finding the balance. And you know, I've I've spent a bit of time investing in knowledge so that I can look after each piece individually. And um, base the, the basically, you're just trying to promote fresh growth and as many different types of micro habitats in the heathland. And by grazing, you're poaching certain pieces of land and uh, opening up sward, which would normally be smothered by mature growth. And that's where burning is so important as well. It clears, clears large areas of mature, stagnant, uh, especially heather. And um, it starts a life cycle again so that you can create a mosaic. And some plants are only available to grow in the heathland at the early stages. Um, of the life cycle and then they get smothered out by the mature growth so by grazing with cattle it's the most natural way to, to promote fresh grasses and fresh growth to enhance the, the maximum amount of bio biodiversity. But I mean naturally you wouldn't actually have those cattle on those heathlands you know back long before farming even existed so how would it have been done then? Like, how can we still justify farming on that heathland when originally it wouldn't have been the case? Uh, well, it would have. It wouldn't. It wouldn't have been beef cattle, but it would have been uh, pre predecessors of the um, of what we now farm. It would have been deer, horses, um, and things like that. So, but they also before we had so many people, it would have been larger herds. So they would have not just stayed on the Lizard Peninsula. The herds of these animals would have. Would have spread a lot further and that's also why there's certain times when horses are used for grazing heathland as well because horses have a more um, specific they'll, they'll pick out individual pieces of grasses and plants to eat them whereas cattle because they roam such large areas they are um, well they just graze over they just take the whole lot and not not so picky about what they eat so that's why there's a there's a case for using both animals but I feel using cattle to graze the heathland, you're doing the conservation work, but also you're still producing food, which is the most environmentally, uh, the, well, the right thing to do in my point, in my eyes. I see. And if we stick on that topic then of the environment and around producing food um, and particularly a meat, um, one of the massive topics at the moment, of course, around the world is climate change. And we have to, we have to look at most of the blame that keeps coming out towards uh, farmers. Uh, it comes towards farmers as well as transport and, uh, and other production um, techniques. And how can we justify in this day and age producing meat when it's talked um, all over the place about the, uh, the higher emissions coming out of, um, of cattle? Um, how would you react to that, Sarah and James? Well, I'd just like to make the point that the slow food movement, which is what we're talking to here, um, that advocates very much to have less meat. And I completely agree with that, 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 that the amount of meat that we're eating is, is phenomenal and far more than I think humanity really needs. Well, a lot of us anyway. Um, and also it, it varies depending on the different region you are. So to say this across the world is a bit of a generalisation. But, um, but I know the slow, slow food movement, movement advocates less meat, but when you do eat it, you know where it comes from, you lower the food miles, you understand how it's being produced and you, you make sure that it's the high enough quality and you're, you're getting it from the people that you should be getting it from and the people who are getting the money are the right people. Um, so that, that would be my argument that we do need to eat meat. I think it's part of our, I'm an ex-anatomist and it's, it's important to our diet. I think some people can thrive on vegan diets, other people can't. But the most important thing is that we, we advocate eating high quality, good food, and we know where it's coming from with the low food miles. Yeah, it's, it's the quantities, not necessarily the quality that's been the problem. Mm. There's, so, there's so, so many different ways of producing, um, producing meat across the world, and each of them have a different carbon footprint. So it's entirely wrong to base, um, to, to tar everyone with the same brush and to think that everyone is having the same sort of impact because it's entirely different. So beef produced in an area where we are, where we have fantastic climate, one of the best climates in the world for producing mm -hmm. grass, um, would arguably have a far better, particularly organic and uh, conservation graze like Dave or Rona, 
um, would have a far better carbon footprint or an impact on the environment than uh, feedlot produced beef in America, which is what unfortunately a lot of people think about when they think of beef. So they see one or two Im images and they, they think, well, that's, that's, that's awful. Um, I have to stay steer away from that, but they don't often see the, the other side of it, which is the more sustainably produced um, beef and red meat products. Right. And um, David and um, Rona, do you have anything to add to that, uh, that topic? The whole drive to cheaper food is such a huge, huge topic and, um, and it's so complex. And, but just on our little scale or what we do, I think the, the cattle add to the biodiversity. There's no doubt about that. We have a lot of very rare plants. We don't have heathland, but we have coastal grazing. And the, the cattle are um, really critical in preserving those rare plants. And these are plants that have their own biodiversity action plans on because they are so rare. Um, I think we need a balance, don't we? And like uh, Sarah says, um, perhaps less meat, but better meat. I'd be very loath to eat broiler chickens and things that have been fed soya and that, but you know, a nice piece of lamb that's been produced properly and adding to the biodiversity, um, I think is an important part of our diet, but it comes down to David educating everybody really, so we can make better decisions. <laughs> <laughs> and I and um, I get a little bit tied up about price and things like that. And that wasn't quite what I meant about charging okay. more to our customers, but it's us having by direct sales, we have more of a, a margin because our prices mm -hmm. are still dictated by the supermarket. Mm -hmm. They set the price. People don't buy from us if we double the price. Yeah. We're not that clever at marketing, but <laughs> we can sell it at the same price as the supermarket, but we have a better margin because we've taken the, the supermarket out of the equation. So we get all of the margin rather than just... Um, a tiny proportion of it and that but it's such a dilemma with it all I feel we need livestock for biodiversity um, and I think livestock is absolutely crucial on the lizard to keep the biodiversity here but climate change is so complicated <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is it certainly is now um really sticking on the topic that you just brought back up in terms of the prices of things uh do you feel, considering the work that you do, um, in many ways, I would say you were probably stewards of the land, um, park rangers, if you might, if you may, uh, do you feel like you're paid correctly for the work and for your produce uh, that you produce? Uh, Rona, I'm going to stay with you. Um, I think one of the things that we make a mistake in, in farming is that everybody is a very, very different um, type of setups. Um, we're what's called a farm business tenancy. We have pay a very high rent. That was because me and my husband don't come from a farm. We've, um, and so it, it's very different from someone that's on generational farms, but some people have mortgages, some people don't. And lumping us all together is very difficult. If farmers looked at a rental equivalent, a rental equivalent of everything they do on a an FBT rent like I do, then everybody would be way below the minimum wage. And it and but we have this real difficult in farming looking at that we should be making a profit and there is no reason why we shouldn't be paid like anybody else being paid a minimum wage. But we find um, that quite a difficult subject in the farming industry. And it's something that is starting to be tackled, but it's something that we really need to tackle and um, uh, industry leaders find it very difficult with their negotiators in supermarkets, um, which are dictating prices. Um, it's a difficult one. I think me and my husband, we wanted to farm and we never thought we were gonna make our fortune. Um, I don't suppose we'll ever be in a position to leave any land or farm into our children, but we, we take what we want out of it. So we're happy with what we're doing. Um, and um, certainly running a tea shop and a diversified business helps. Um, we've got quite a large family and I think we have a really good lifestyle, but we're not gonna be leaving generations of farming there. They've got to go make their own way, which is fine. And that's what a lot of people are like and that, but, um, and we're happy with what we get, but it is something the farming industry needs to address about how we maybe have a little bit bigger part of the pie rather than all the middlemen and the processors taking all of it. What's really frustrating, I don't know if you find this, Rona, too, is that we also produce cuts of beef that you just can't get in the supermarket. You don't really get briskets and shin. They get stewing meat, but half the fat's being cut off, which is most of the flavour, in our opinion. Um, 
and and it's such it's such a frustrating thing to see people going and paying probably the equivalent of one of our briskets on processed meat that probably won't feed them for very long and it's all packaged and it's been aged in the package and it's gone it's come from god knows where and then we're producing this delicious brisket that would feed a family of four for three days um, but I just don't think people realise it's out there to actually going to actually go and find it is, is difficult. Um, so, again, it's, it's about marketing and education and it's not something that farmers are, mm-hmm. are well versed at. I think we're getting better, but it is hard to get that message out there to people. I think people are finding, I think people are finding that um, the education and the diversification is becoming part of a farming business, mm-hmm. but it's actually it is. Historically, it's a different business. Um, most farmers know how to look after land, grow crops, milk, or whatever they're doing. But not many people are actually um, up to speed, qualified to use technology nowadays to actually to do exactly that, to direct sell or diversify. And um, I think it's a shame that farmers are having to do that um, to make a living and look after, you know, to, to have a sustainable business as well as a sustainable environment. Um, it's a shame that farmers can't just look after the environment and produce food sustainably and make a living. Well, that's an interesting topic you're talking about. Because so let's stay on that idea of value, um, public value, product value in terms of um, the amount of money people are paying for their um, their product, but. Also, if you look around the world, uh, many schemes are, um, are, in, are put in place to support agriculture. Uh, particularly in the UK we, um, and across Europe, there was the, uh, the single farm payment scheme, uh, countryside stewardship, and it's actually all changing in the UK now uh, through this new uh, payment scheme called ELMS. I'm sure you all know a lot about this scheme. And so I'd just like to have a little bit input from you guys in terms of what would you like to see? in terms of payments in from these schemes, what should they be producing? Because the public are funding it, the public should be getting good value out of it. So how should, why should they pay and what should they be paying for? I'm gonna start with you, David. Um, yeah, I think the key of everything we look at as a business is, is you're right, it's all about value. It's not about the cost or how much you're being paid. It, it should all be about value because that is, as you say, as the public are looking at it, that is the main thing. Um, as a farming business, you don't make any money out of doing environmentally friendly practices generally. Um, I'm organic, but the bottom line, I'd be no better or worse off if I was conventional or organic. I do it because I believe in it. And I think um, in terms of future payments, which is massive, massive part of our incomes, um, I think it's, it's sounding like it's going the right way. We are gonna move towards being paid to look after the environment, growing wild bird seed, nectar, flower rich grasses and so forth. And hopefully if everyone says what they want to happen has enough money behind it, then it will change the whole landscape of the whole UK, not just the lizard. Um, but like everything, we're, we've, we're all part of the test and trial group for the New Elm scheme. And it all makes sense, it all could be brilliant, but until somebody puts money behind it, farmers won't change their practice unless they can still get the same bottom line so that they can run a sustainable business. Okay, and Rona, do you have anything to add on that? Do you, do you think that this is actually good value for public to be even giving you any money at all? Um, yeah, I, there's a whole problem with the subsidy system, isn't there, that um, everybody says it's taxpayers' money. And basically we are subsidising cheap food because most people wouldn't be able to farm without a single farm payment um, and direct support at the moment, which is something that's really got to be tackled. Again, it's down to uh, the industry deciding what we're worth, really. Um, The environmental schemes have got a lot of promise. I hope that they do come through. Um, I think that we're doing a lot of environmental stuff on the lizard already. I think a really good environmental scheme will support farmers to continue doing really good work on the lizard. Um, but also a good environmental scheme could make some huge difference in parts of the country where there is not much biodiversity. Um, we, we're halfway there, but a lot of the areas of the country have uh, lost a lot of their biodiversity. And I think so a really good um, ALM scheme could see things really improve. Um, my 
<laughs> my worry as a tenant is with all the subsidies, the um, the tenders for a farm business tenancy tends to take all the subsidies into account and you take it in one hand and give it to your landlord in the other hand. And that's the sort of thing that's got to be really carefully worked on. And I know the Tenant Farmers Association are battling those sort of schemes to try and make sure it stays as farmer. I mean, it's like, a, again, like with selling your meat, it's who takes all the cuts out of it and takes the money away from you before you get your few pence at the end. So there's quite a lot to battle through yet. Um, and of course, coronavirus hasn't helped very much with um, trying to get some of these things going, but hopefully it's got a lot of promise and, uh, and it should be really good for the lizard. Um, there's some really great ideas and some really good ideas about farmers cooperating across groups and things like that, which a bit more joined up thinking would be really valuable. Great. And Sarah and James, taking your business forward into the future, what would you like to see to help you bring your business forward, help biodiversity, really in engage with the food production so that you have a sustainable future? Well, I think um, most definitely the days of sort of free money that the uh, single farm payment provided are most definitely over or coming to an end very soon, and probably quite rightly so. Um, but the problem is so many farms, something like 70% of livestock farmers are dependent on it. They don't make any profit um, if that is taken out of the equation. So a, a lot of businesses have a lot of thinking to do and a lot of, um, a lot of restructuring to do. Um, but I think through cost cutting regenerative um, methods, it is possible to still make a living from it. Um, I think this ELM scheme has got a lot of good promise. Um, but as, as Rona and David both kind of hinted at, if the payments aren't there, a lot of farmers won't, won't necessarily be able to make it worth their while to do it. Because if it's one thing paying farmers to carry out these tasks, but if the rates of payment don't do any more than just cover the cost of actually doing it, the farmers aren't going to be any better off. So I think the risk we have as a country is that we could end up seeing a split. Some farmers just say, well, I'm not going to bother. Uh, a lot of farmers could go out of business, a lot of land could come on the market. You could see actually farmers getting larger and larger and more intensive. And some, a, a small group would go more regenerative and there could be a, a split. So I think if we're, we, we want to really try and avoid that. But for us personally, um, I think going more traditional and making the, making the most of any environmental schemes that we can help biodiversity and hopefully furthering our direct selling efforts will be the way to go for us because you a business you, you cannot expect to survive forever on on handouts it's just it's not going to last like say with with the threat of brexit and the pandemic now as well who knows what if we're going to get any money at all so i think a lot of farmers are going to be in for a big shock if they if they don't start getting prepared for it now right. i think Rona's made an excellent point saying it's such a shame that we can't actually run our businesses without the subsidies that it's so driven by ex imported prices and imported food that, that we we physically can't run a farm without without those subsidies um, and it'd be great if in the future if we could start to do that i think we're not on um we're not on a level playing field that's the problem that's why this i think there's so much importance on the new trade agreements with other countries around the world mm. um i think that's going to be the biggest thing for us moving forward is that it's so cheap to import that we have to, we're always fighting for the bottom, fighting for the cheapest. Whereas the importance of these deals hopefully can say that meat being, in, well, not just meat, vegetables, everything, all food being imported is to the same standard as ours. And generally, especially across Europe, most of the costs of producing that food is similar. So the farmers in, in Germany, Netherlands, wherever, should be having similar costs to us and that hopefully will level the playing field that we can all as a whole industry not just in the uk uh you know improve improve standards mm. and i think that the whole imported um, and like you say all the trade deals what my big worry is that it's going to just push our meat even further into this luxury brand which then immediately cuts out half of our population because they don't either feel they're good enough for it or worthy of it or they just can't afford it yeah, which is a real shame. They should, they should, it should be accessible to all of the people around us locally. Great. Well, uh, obviously, this conversation could go on for hours, uh, and I'm sure it has done between you all uh, in the recent times. But 
uh, we, that's enough uh, for us for today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, Rona, Sarah and James for joining us. Um, you. If you at home would like to find out more about any of our farmers and what they're up to, please do look them up online. Uh, thank you very much for watching and goodbye from us all here at The Lizard. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.